<laughs> okay, thank you so much. Welcome. Welcome to the um, first ever <laughs> OCB Marine Carbon Dioxide Workshop on Measurement, Reporting, and Verification. We're so excited to have you all here, and we'll be even more excited when the second bus full of people <laughs> is able to arrive. Um, so thanks for your patience as we got a little bit of a late start, and thanks for making the trip here and, and being part of this. I have just the very brief honor of introducing our Dean, Paula Bontempi, a GSO alumna who came back after most of you know her as a program manager at NASA. Um, and during the pandemic, she came and became our very treasured Dean. And we're very lucky to have her here. Um, <laughs> big, big. Um, <laughs> so, um, but in, in any case, I'm gonna hand it off to her to bring us, give us a welcome, and a land acknowledgement, and, um, and then we'll move on from there to Jessica and some logistics. Thank you, Jamie, and uh, welcome everybody. Um, it's funny, I know a lot of you um, from my previous life and I haven't seen many of you in a couple of years. So it's really a pleasure. Um, uh, I, I didn't mask today because I just got the bivariate and I wanna put it to use. So we'll, we'll see if it actually works. Anyway, um, thank you, Jamie. Thank you for inviting me. I will be super brief. You have really amazing things to talk about this week. Um, I wish I could sit here with you all week. I can't, but I look forward to hearing the highlights and popping in when I can. So um, the university uh, recently developed a new land acknowledgement with our um, indigenous population, the Narragansett Tribal Nation. So um, the University of Rhode Island occupies the traditional lands and stomping grounds of the Narragansett Tribal Nation and the Neantic people. We honor and respect the enduring and continuing relationship between the indigenous people and this land, as well as our coasts, by teaching and learning more about their history and present day communities and becoming stewards of the land that we too now inhabit. Uh, when Jamie asked me to say a few words this morning, I started thinking about, you know, revectoring my brain and what was going to be important. I think a couple of things are happening that are very big right now and offer a lot of opportunity. First of all, uh, the Biden administration investment in renewable energy, renewable energy sources, and of course, a lot of the topics you're going to talk about and carbon dioxide removal, and what that actually means and what comes with it scientifically. Um, everything from uh, basic research and discovery driven research to actually linking that to applied research. What does MRV really mean? How do we know it happened? How long is carbon or our carbon species going to stay sequestered? Um, do they stay in the ocean? Do they go back in the atmosphere? What are the approaches? What are the opportunities there? And what does it mean? Where are the best investments for the federal government? So I'm sure internationally that is also a discussion as by the uh, attendees today that links us to COP26 and the high level panel on oceans, um, thinking about a sustainable ocean economy, sustainable ocean resources and what that actually means for the future, for future generations. Um, I have to say, uh, I was in a meeting last week where no less than two people uh, still approach me about whether climate change is real and whether there's actually a benefit for humans. It's hard to believe that that conversation, that dialogue, those questions are still out there. Um, one would say the science is somewhat settled, if not completely settled on that. Um, but it remains a challenge to convince our international scientific and global community that this is a shared challenge and a shared opportunity for solution. Um, I look forward to hearing about the outcomes over time. As I said, I wish I could sit here. I know some of the United States federal agencies are looking at targeted investments like DOE on um, negative carbon, what that means and where that's going to go. So have a great week. Um, if I can do anything to make the week uh, more friendly, um, Jamie, let me know um, the receptions, the audio visual um, breakout rooms, things like that. I'll be here all week and I wish you guys the best of luck. Thank you for letting me say a few words. Thanks, Jamie. By the way, the appointment of John Podesta offers a real opportunity. So keep your eyes open for new things coming down the pipe for the US community.
All right, well, good morning, everybody. Uh, I am so excited uh, that we are here and we get to have these conversations with each other. Um, to tell a little bit of a personal story at the beginning, this is something that I feel like has been the natural outgrowth of my career across the last decade. Uh, when I first started working with carbon biogeochemistry in Alaska, um, you know, Paula just told that story about how the science isn't settled. I've been so lucky to work up there because climate change is a lived experience. No one argues with me about whether or not it's true because they're living it every single day. The number one question, the difficult conversations that I get to have are, what do we do about it? And for a decade, I had to politely say, as kindly as I could, there's really nothing you can do about it. We as a global community have to do something about this. You know, it, at the same time, when a community is trying to build a climate resilience toolkit, that's local actions that they want to take in order to uh, mitigate risk, uh, as well as try to adapt to the conditions that they are seeing. Um, uh, as well as adapt to the conditions that they are seeing. Uh, so regardless of whether or not uh, our, uh, regardless of whether or not the global community is going to stop emitting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere as a way of combating climate change, as a way of uh, potentially slowing um, uh, uh, the uh, sum total risk of ocean acidification, they need something to do now. And so in my circles, uh, folks started uh, asking me what do we do? Like, hey, Jess, what about some of these CDR activities? Do you think that's going to help us locally emit ocean acidification? Um, I started looking into it. Uh, and what I'm showing on this map here is the amount of CDR that we think is going to be necessary by the year 2050 and the year 2100, shown in the black bars on the right hand side, uh, compared to our global carbon budget that's on the left. That's a lot of carbon to remove. Uh, and even then, there's a certain degree of um, change that is already locked in, especially for the oceans. So I was very skeptical uh, when the communities were coming to me saying, hey, Jess, is this something that we're going to be able to do that might have some scale of local impact? Uh, at the same time, uh, the global community saw, hey, we know we're going to need a lot. Uh, we know we're going to need to remove a lot of carbon. That means that the industry that is actually removing carbon from the atmosphere needs to grow extremely quickly. Um, so this is a plot from, uh, I think, Minx et al. 2018 that indicates that getting started uh, right now in 2020, what we need by the time we get to 2050 is roughly a 6% annual growth in that industry. There's a lot of money to be made here. And when we start talking about the uh, uh, scale of industry, when we start putting things in terms of jobs and dollars, suddenly things that looked impossible start to become possible. Early investments has, have already made this, uh, have, already remade, have already made carbon removal an astoundingly big market. 60% growth during 2021, a $6.7 billion total valuation for the sector, and that's low. Um, and then projected for 2050, we think it might be worth $200 billion. Investors are paying attention and saying, we think that carbon trading and carbon removal is essentially going to be a one-way bet. The only thing that this is going to do is build in value over time. But as you know, and as I know, uh, and as Microsoft knows, as they wrote about and experienced this year, um, building those projects and being able to buy and sell carbon offsets and carbon removal credits on the market doesn't necessarily mean that carbon is actually being removed from the atmosphere. Here on the left, I'm showing a plot um, uh, from Bloom Bloomberg Green that indicates the percentage of projects um, that are actually uh, 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 removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And as you can see, it's pretty sad. We want to be able to build value and get a little bit better at this. There have been a number of voluntary um, uh, standards groups uh, that have tried to indicate, hey, we need more MRV. We need more integrity in this market. It's not going to grow and be a stable market if 
we can't uh, prove that we're actually selling the things that people want to buy, right? If a market gets overloaded with uh, inflated junk asset assets, that creates a bubble. Bubbles crash. People don't want to invest in markets that look highly speculative like that. Um, and so we need uh, the opportunity to set better standards. Stephanie Arcuza recently published this snapshot of carbon removal certification and standards um, uh, system. And what I'm highlighting here in the red box uh, is the ocean carbon removal system. You can see how weakly linked that bottom row and all of those different methods of carbon removal are to the upper rows that are standards, um, uh, uh, voluntary standards or uh, compliance standards uh, for that market. So while voluntary and compliance standards are certain abounding and growing and there are many ways to certify your product, we don't necessarily have that yet for some of these ocean methods. In part, that's because as this community can say, whether we're talking about the global scale or the local scale, these measurements are really hard to make. Uh, what I'm showing here on the left, um, hats off to David Ho who tweeted this out earlier this week. Um, uh, uh, is the difference between uh, modeled results and measured results just in the size of the ocean sink. Uh, and he compared that to the size of a single DAC plant, which is really big, right? Almost a million DAC plants worth of offset there. On the right-hand side, I'm showing um, a, a time series from a kelp-based carbon removal project that took place in Puget Sound. Um, this is courtesy of Simone Allen, and you can see how noisy uh, that plot is. I don't really want you to take away anything other than the fact that that's very noisy. So then the industry comes to me and says, well, why bother? If these measurements are so hard to make, if these things are so hard to model, why can't we just start from first principles and say, in theory, this works, let us sell it. Let's certify it that way, right? It's gonna to be too expensive to solve this problem. But the reality is that a combination of observations and models and careful treatment of uncertainty is how we handle our knowledge of the global carbon budget right now. And new technology continues to be developed all the time. I know there are voices in this room that participated in XPRIZE in the development of the biogeochemical Argo array uh, and uh, folks that have now been uh, growing work with sail drone uh, that's enabled us to take um, surface measurements. So it's very likely that we'll continue to, to apply a combination of observations and models, aspiring to improvements in both, trying to find the right balance between the two in some sort of uh, uh, ethical um, uh, MRV system that has a high integrity. So that brings us to this week. What are we going to do this week? At this workshop, what I want us to be able to do is inform and engage our community. Uh, I also, um, uh, our steering committee, not just me, wants us to also be able to highlight major open questions. We're not going to solve anything at this workshop. The end of this workshop is not going to be a set of standards. We can't do that in four days. But what we can do is start understanding the research that is going to be necessary to help us set those standards and understand what certification might look like in the future. So at this workshop, one thing we don't want to do is we're not going to debate the necessity of CDR. It's been in the last four IPCC reports. Um, we don't want to lose focus on the fact that what we are talking about here is net negative. So we're talking about carbon removal, not CCUS, which enables reuse of the carbon that gets removed. Another thing that we don't want to see people doing is triaging CDR methods. Um, many of you will have a pet method or a favorite method. Um, give space to people who might have a different one than you do. Uh, so we're not here to say this works and this doesn't. We're not prepared to do that yet. Uh, so how are we going to accomplish that? How are we going to inform and engage the community and assess these open questions? Uh, we don't have a lot of time, uh, so we're presupposing that this community has a good grasp of the basics. This workshop is going to be a deep dive. We hope that you learn a lot, but we also hope that you come with a certain level of background knowledge. We designed the workshop to include uh, keynote talks at the beginning of each session that lead into a panel and then that end with breakout sessions where all of you have the opportunity to share your voice. 
We did this because we want it to be a two-way conversation. Try and listen to each other. Try and learn all that you can from the other participants in the workshop this week. That being said, our participants include scientists, program managers, nonprofit representatives, as well as a few folks from private industry. Uh, so try to think outside your niche. You're going to hear from some folks that you're not necessarily accustomed to hearing from. Um, I put some QR codes up on the screen for our agenda, for some background reading, if you feel like you still want to do that, as well as a list of our in-person attendees um, and the sign-up sheet. If you are a virtual attendee and you want to let people know you are here, uh, please uh, click over there and fill out your contact information. So session one, setting the baseline. What can we learn from CDR and MRV and other fields is the topic of session one, which dovetails right into session two, where we'll be discussing what exists right now for marine CDR, MRV, and maybe what some of the gaps are. Here is a spray of some of the different programs uh, uh, and folks that you might hear from as a part of that session. Uh, it includes people that are debuting um, uh, verification frameworks, uh, as well as folks that are actually sitting down to run research programs uh, in, um, uh, uh, in MRV. Uh, we have a representative from ARPA-E that's going to join us this week. The second session is all about models, methods, and measurements. This is really where we get into the details. Uh, session 3A is going to focus on permanence, uh, and session 3B is going to focus on methods and sea air CO2 flux. We know this is why a lot of you are here, and we're really excited uh, to see what we've put together for that session. Um, to highlight why that is important, I wanted to take a minute uh, and highlight the work of uh, Hang Ji Wang and Brendan Carter, um, who have uh, really been leading a study to show this simulation of alkalinity enhanced carbon removal uh, in the Bering Sea. Uh, and what they found is that it's really necessary to spread that material over as large of a volume of water as possible so that you get lots of space to interact with the atmosphere, but that necessarily dilutes your signal. So even though you can simulate that that's going to be successful, you may not ever be able to measure the fact that that is true. Um, so we really want to understand, again, what the balance between observations and models is going to be in MRV. We know we're going to need both. Um, the next sort of set of sessions in the workshop really focus on interdisciplinary aspects. Uh, session four is about environmental factors and secondary processes that might affect MRV. We want to say up front that this is not an ecosystem impacts session. We're not going to be assessing what the ecosystem impacts of these some of these CDR methods might what these environmental impacts might be, but talking about how interplays in the food web and some of these secondary reactions may reduce the efficiency of MRV. Session five is then about data justice, environmental justice, and practical ethics. How do we choose good partners as scientists? How do we avoid causing as much harm as we possibly can? How do we as scientists become ethical actors in this space? On the last day, on Friday, we're going to have a highly interactive set of sessions, very limited number of talks. Um, please stick around and stay with us. Your voice is essential, and this is really where you get to tell us what you think, what you've learned during this workshop, what you think the gaps are, what you think we should be doing next. The steering committee um, suggests, and we'll do sessions on each of these, uh, that we want both a short-term product as well as a long-term strategy. Uh, and so we're going to ask you what should the output from this workshop be? What should go in the report? What did we learn that the rest of the community might need to know? Uh, and then as well, we're going to ask you to task a long-term OCB working group focused on marine CDR MRV. What should that look like? Do you want a science plan? Do you want something different? Uh, we hope over, you'll be thinking about these potential outcomes over the course of the week and come to Friday really prepared to engage in those ideas. So with that, I'm going to pass uh, the microphone off to Heather. Um, I hope that that has given you a good context and setting for what we're going to do during this workshop. Uh, and Heather is going to share just a few logistical items before we get started with our first session. I'm so glad we're here. I'm so excited to learn from all of you this week. Mm 
It's not yours. <laughs> she can do her time too. Thank you. What's that? Okay, great. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Sorry about the morning hiccups. And if I didn't get to give you a hug, I will do so at the break. Um, <laughs> running around dealing with some stuff. And I think some people still are stranded, and hopefully they'll be here soon. My name is Heather Benway. For those who don't know me, I am the director of the Ocean Carbon and Biogeochemistry Program and Project Office, um, which is based at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. Um, we are supported by NSF, NASA, and we are based at HUI. Um, I just wanted to give you a little bit of backstory to how this all came about. If you look at what OCB is all about, OCB is really a, a big, vibrant scientific network. And you can see in these green icons here, those are our focus areas. So you can see why having a focus on CDR makes sense with this community because we have the baseline knowledge to be able to problem solve in this important space. And so this workshop was really about mobilizing this community and equipping them with the tools that they need and setting a blueprint. This workshop is an opportunity to work across a lot of stakeholders that our scientific community may or may not be used to working with. And it's a really great opportunity for us to just all have a dialogue. And if you look at these green icons and you look at this, I mean, we are really working at the nexus of climate, and marine ecosystems and changing ocean biogeochemistry. This is a really important research area, particularly, particularly for marine CDR. And we're really excited. This is something that I've been talking to Jess about for quite a long time and really enthusiastic to mobilize the OCB community to, to push this forward in a rapid but well thought out way. So um, just a little bit about who OCB is and what we do. Um, we do a lot of community science activities. A lot of the people in this room have already been part of them, workshops, working groups, training activities, a lot of synthesis work. Um, a lot of scientific steering and science planning um, on the contributing both to international, but also leading national science planning efforts. Um, communication and networking. We are really a centralized resource for our community. We try to make sure they're well informed about what's not only going on in our program, but in, in, in related programs. We are very involved in training and capacity building, really supportive network for early career scientists. And I've seen a lot of early career scientists in my long stint with this program become leaders in our community. And it's a really inspiring thing. And also education and outreach, just building knowledge, building the knowledge base of, of all age groups and, and media materials, FAQ documents, public outreach white websites, you name it. We, we do a lot in our, our little project office. I want to say I'm Heather, and I want to also say Mary Zawoski, who could not be here today, was responsible for most of the logistics that, that you're seeing, and it was not her fault the bus didn't come this morning. <laughs> and um, I also want to point out my right-hand man here. This is May Mahegan, my right-hand woman. Awesome. Makes everything work also. So uh, we're a team of three. Um, and we have an amazing scientific steering committee that that helps out too. Um, really, just really set a nice tone for this. I don't feel like I have too much to say here, but I would love everybody to check your preconceived notions at the door. If you have motivations, anything that you have coming into this meeting, I want you to chuck it at the door and come in here to learn something and interact with people you've not interacted before. That is what this meeting is about. Like Jess said, if you have a pet method, you should learn more about other methods. As scientists, we are here to learn. We are also here to educate. So there's a lot we can learn from, from others at this meeting. Um, I think there's a, lot, there's, there's a lot of private industry here and there's a lot to be learned from 
private industry representatives too, who really know how markets tick and how things work. So let's come in here without these motivations and preconceived notions and pet methods and come together to learn something new. That is what we're all about here. Um, we want to, to really set a framework for guiding the research to support MRV. And we want to really broaden the lens a little bit to think about justice considerations and, and how different sectors will be affected, impacted by the, the science that we're doing. So that brings me to the ground rules. Um, looks like this is a little cut off, but um, speakers and panelists, please, please, please remember to disclose any relationships that you have with companies and not-for-profit organizations in the CDR realm. Just say it really quickly up front before you speak. This is common practice in these kinds of dialogues. Please refrain from any promotional commentary with any commercial aim. That is not why we're here. And please avoid any dismissive judgments of specific um, MCDR approaches and technologies. They are all on the table and they are all, they all have their strengths and weaknesses and we're here to have a constructive dialogue. That brings me really quickly to the OCB code of conduct. This is really important to us and we are very serious about it. OCB doesn't tolerate any form of harassment, bullying, intimidation, or discrimination of any form, no physical or verbal abuse, no deliberate disruption of presentations or any form of communication. We don't interrupt each other. We're respectful. We critique ideas and not individuals. I want you all to be observers and allies in this space. If you experience troubling behavior, behaviors or you witness somebody being harassed, please speak up. It's your responsibility to do so. Please be patient and kind, especially with all of us as we experience, if we have any technical difficulties or logistical difficulties, please be patient and kind. Um, the OCB staff is also at an institution we don't know very well, so it's, it's not our stomping grounds. We don't um, you will see these little signs up around. These are QR codes. If you have a disturbing or you see a disturbing incident, I want you to use your phone and click on, take a picture and go to the website. This will take you to our code of conduct page where you will find an orange button to report an incident and you can do so anonymously. If you feel more comfortable, you can pull May or me aside or any of the workshop organizers aside and, and talk to us and we will handle it. Um, if there is an issue, we will talk to somebody about the problem and if it's not resolved, then that person will be dismissed from the workshop. So please take heed right now and know that we take this very, very seriously. Um, I don't know if it got pointed out who all the workshop organi organizers are, but I feel like they should really quickly just stand up. We've got Jessica Cross, we've got Jamie Palter, we've got Claire Reimers, where are you? There you are. Um, we have Matt Long, we have Leonard Bach, we have Patrick Raptor. Okay, Leonard will be here soon. <laughs> so thank you very much to them. A few quick logistical notes and then we're gonna get started. So the Wi-Fi is either Eduroam or URI open. If you try to join either of those, if you have an Eduroam license from your own institution, you should be able to just jump right on, but you will be self-guided through URI's process um, to get on the internet. The restrooms are that way behind the auditorium. I put a little sign on the, the double door so you can go through and find them. There's also drinking water so you can fill your water bottles back there. Um, the breakout rooms, um, hazard A and B are to this side of the auditorium. It's just one big room, but it's cut in half. So there's that's where the hazard A and B people go. There is a large conference room, CIB 120, which is on the back hallway back there behind the auditorium. And then the other two breakouts are gonna be the front of this room and the back of this room, basically. So, um, that clarifies that. We also have a small conference room reserved, which I believe Jess will be using for the virtual breakouts. And then when we have the breakout synthesis meetings where all the breakout leaders come together, those will be in that room as well. I have put around little sticky poster note things all over the meeting spaces. 
those are idea boards and those are for you. You can use them for any form of brainstorming, sticky note exercises, prioritizing. If you wanna talk about a project idea with somebody, use them. We have tons of those things and you can take them with you. Um, I would love it if you take a picture and send it to me first before you run off with it, just so I can see the products of these discussions and interactions, but those are everywhere. They're in the breakout rooms. There are sticky notes all over the place and markers. So have at it and use them. We have lots of them. And that I believe is all I have to say. Let's get going with the good stuff. Thanks everyone. All right, well, welcome to session one. I'm so excited to get us kicked off this morning. Our first speaker is going to be Patty. Um, virtual? Yep, OK. Um, whenever you're ready. Hi, I'm, um, I'm unable to start my video. It says, can you guys hear me? Sorry. Yes. It says the um, host has stopped my video. I'm not allowed to start video. Oh, there we go. Thank you. <laughs> okay, let me start sharing my screen and hold it here. Okay, great. Okay, can you all hear me and see me all right? You can. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Again, I'm Patty Oikawa, and um, I'm from Cal City Bay, um, Earth and Environmental Sciences. Um, but I'm currently um, on sabbatical in Spain, so I'm I'm so sorry I couldn't be there today in person. I've been to OCB workshops in the past, and they're fantastic. Um, so I'm sad not to be there in person. Um, but thank you all for having me. Um, I will be kicking us off here with um, sort of lessons that I've learned and sort of perspectives from um, other fields of nature-based climate solutions with a, I'm going to be talking mostly today about wetland restoration and coastal environments. Um, so yeah, I'll give a little background on my experience in this field. Um, some of the kind of key take-home points um, and sort of um, lessons learned from these fields, and then spend quite a bit of time too talking about the future of carbon markets, at, at least in, in my field, and a lot of this um, will apply to ocean work as well. Okay, so um, some, we've already touched on this a little bit, but I wanted to emphasize the importance and sort of um, momentum behind nature-based climate solutions right now um, that, if you guys didn't catch it, in the most recent IPCC report, um, they really highlighted uh, the importance of these um, nature-based solutions. I've um, shown, boxed them off in red here, things like ecosystem restoration and carbon sequestration in soils. And the scale of the removal and mitigation potential of these methods is on par with things like adoption of um, wind and solar energy. So there is a lot of you know, speculation and interest um, in these um, methods. Um, however, you can see from the colors of these bars, they are estimated as being more expensive approaches for mitigating climate change. Um, and also the uncertainty around um, the potential of these methods is really high. Um, and there's also a lot of funding, as um, some of the original speakers here have been mentioning, in these fields, for example, a billion dollars earlier this year from the USDA, um, new climate legislation adding $2.6 billion over the next five years for coastal environments with really clear support um, of nature-based climate solutions. There's an article in the New York Times on this last week. Um, so there's a lot of work being done in this area um, and a lot of momentum, as I mentioned. But my kind of first foray into this uh, field and work goes back to 2016 when I was a postdoc at Berkeley. 
and I was called upon to help um, co-author a greenhouse gas methodology for wetland restoration in California. And this is for the kind of the San Francisco Bay Delta region um, and operating in the voluntary carbon market. So this is basically a document that just outlines exactly how you quantify carbon sequestration in baseline conditions and then restored wetland conditions. And you actually um, can you know, quantify the metric tons of CO2 removal and then sell those on the voluntary carbon market. And one thing that stood out about our methodology was it was the first one that ever allowed the usage of eddy covariance data, which is my um, expertise is in and the field that I come from. And for those of you who aren't familiar with eddy covariance, it's just you're using instruments, greenhouse gas sensors that are mounted above your ecosystem um, and you can measure exactly how much CO2 or methane or whatever gas you're looking at is getting exchanged between the atmosphere and the ecosystem. And this is continuous data at an ecosystem scale. So it was um, uh, a big departure from kind of the more traditional MRV uh, carbon monitoring techniques like sediment coring and tree inventorying. And there was a lot of kind of um, working with people in these carbon markets, like people from the American Carbon Registry, um, people in the industry were a little hesitant and unsure of adopting these new types of technologies. That's something I'll be um, coming back to. So this uh, protocol was um, adopted and verified by the American Carbon Registry, who is uh, responsible for um, overseeing carbon credits in the voluntary market, but also in the California compliance market. Um, and the Air Resources Board in California recently recommended adopting this methodology into the compliance market. And this is going to take a couple years, so it's not there yet, but it's on the way. Um, and since then, we've had um, some projects um, that have used the protocol in the Sacramento Delta. This is a photo of, of um, over overview of the photo of the Delta here. Um, and one example is the California Department of Water Resources did a really large wetland restoration project. And using this methodology, they receive $60 an acre. Um, and once this is in the compliance market, though, you could receive a lot more support for these types of um, wetland restoration projects, um, which can help with the cost. Obviously, it's very expensive um, to restore wetlands in the San Francisco area. Um, and there's a lot more projects in the pipeline. I wanted to mention a few, you know, islands that have been purchased in the Delta recently that are being scoped out um, and planned to be managed sustainably. So um, Steve Deverell at HydroFocus, their firm is helping some of these new island owners, you know, use rice mixed with seasonal wetlands, et cetera, to um, manage the land sustainably and also um, mitigate climate. Okay, so getting to the first kind of key concept of, of MRV and carbon markets is additionality. I wanted to talk about that first. And just to remind everyone, this is the idea or concept that an, an offset um, wouldn't have happened otherwise, right? Either by law or by business as usual. So this wetland has to be constructed um, and because of this carbon market scenario, um, and it can't have been just status quo, basically. This is something we're kind of struggling with right now in tidal wetlands, um, for example, in systems that may be um, vulnerable to flooding and collapse. And because of additionality and things like that, there's a lot of ecosystems and, and spaces that are just not eligible to operate in carbon markets. So it's a really important concept and something I'm sure will come up throughout the workshop this week. Um, I also wanted to highlight the importance of baseline. So obviously this is the, you know, the carbon offsets um, differential that we're looking at here and that we're quantifying. So the amount of carbon or greenhouse gas emissions in your status quo, in this case, the part of California we were working in was like cornfields or pasture lands or alfalfa. 
and then comparing that to the restored wetland. And it's that when you're constraining that difference, it's a really critical part of operating in these markets. And if you, the more constrained you are, the more accurate your data are, your modeled results are, the more viable the project is. And you become, you get penalized for having high uncertainty in either um, the baseline or the project. And I just wanted to show this time-lapse video of some of the data that we were able to collect in these systems. So this is an eddy covariance tower that was installed right at the beginning of a project. So when a pasture was flooded and allowed to re return and, and turn into a, um, a flooded wetland, right? And so we were able to measure all of the greenhouse gas exchange in the pasture scenario and as it transitioned into a wetland. So we, again, emphasizing here the really the importance and value of having continuous um, large scale data sets of both baseline and project. And, and the reason, part of the reason why this methodology in wetland restoration in California is doing so well um, is because we have this, these great data sets. So we have multiple years of eddy covariance data in lots of different baseline habitats like corn, alfalfa, pasture, et cetera. And then lots, many, many years also of data from the restored wetlands as they are young, one to three years, all the way up to 20 year old um, wetlands. So um, that's another something everyone's kind of striving towards. Okay, and then leakage is another concept I wanted to mention at least. And this is when carbon markets unintentionally create greenhouse gas emissions elsewhere. Um, and sort of best to talk about examples here, but the for California compliance market, for example, um, they're trying to incentivize importing electricity that's you know renewable and it's not coming from coal-fired power plants. However, if um, these power companies are simply buying energy from other sources and those coal-fired power plants are just pivoting and selling their electricity to someone else, we're actually not creating a net reduction of greenhouse gas emissions globally, right? It's just uh, gives you the sense of being cleaner. Um, and so that's a huge thing that we're constantly dealing with. And I'll give you a wetland restoration example, which is that for the Delta, um, we are, we're going from degraded peatlands like corn, alfalfa into wetlands. And what we had to show for our methodology was that, you know, transitioning crops away from crops and into wetlands, you're not increasing market demand for corn, for example, somewhere else and leading to deforestation in the Amazon or something like that, just to, um, just make clear that this is very, very complicated and all these things are connected globally and um, economics are a really big piece of this. So we had to run a big economic analysis to show that this conversion of land wouldn't, wouldn't create leakage. Okay, and then the last big concept I wanted to cover was permanence. And this is pretty obvious that we just wanna make sure these offsets are secure in the long term. And for wetland restoration in the American Carbon Registry Standard, we had to monitor and um, ensure for 40 years. Um, and this is gonna depend on where you are, what kind of system you're working with and what kind of market you're working under. Um, but we needed to run risk analyses for these restoration projects to evaluate external and internal factors like environmental factors like flooding or fire or et cetera, internal factors like financial viability. You don't want the project to just collapse and then um, the wetland isn't maintained, for example. So sometimes um, what people use are these buffer pools where you're depositing a certain percentage of your carbon credits every year into a buffer pool and building those up over time in case your project fails. You can also pull out insurance policies. Um, so one thing with tidal wetlands that we're kind of um, grappling with right now is, you know, is sea level rise going to increase so fast that we have tidal wetland collapse, and then it's hard to secure the, you know, ensure the permanence of these credits. 
Okay, so next I wanted to switch and pivot and talk about lessons learned. So there are really two main lessons I wanted to bring your attention to. And the first is scale emergent processes and um, biophysical feedbacks falls underneath there. And so this is the idea that, you know, a lot of these climate mitigation projects are studied at smaller scales. Um, and at least in my field, they have been historically. And so when you scale these up, you know, which is what we need to do um, at the global level, there are unintentional consequences. There are biophysical processes that can emerge um, and it's easy to miss those. Um, so just an example out of my lab, we're also, I don't only work in wetlands. This is a grassland system and the, the treatment here was applying compost to rangelands. And all of the historic uh, science that had been done in this sphere had been done at plot scales. And we were the first to do this at um, large multi-hectare scale treatment and monitor with eddy covariance. And we were able to actually see really um, extreme changes in phenology and reflectance of the land surface in this case, over 50 day longer growing season, changes in the water cycle. So um, we all know carbon and water cycling are, are tightly linked. So these are things that um, can be missed depending on um, what scale you're working at. And then the second one is blind spots. So being mindful of processes that your measurements or your data don't see. Um, and a great example of this is um, monitoring in tidal wetland ecosystems. Um, Ariana Arias Artis's paper shows this really elegantly where we were comparing any covariance data in blue, uh, measuring carbon sequestration in non-tidal wetlands compared to the traditional MRV approaches of soil sediment cores and how any covariance in sediment cores agreed really well in these non-tidal environments. But once you move into tidal wetlands, um, they completely disagree. And so the any covariance data see a really high sequestration rate and the soil sediment um, cores say, okay, there's very, very small amounts of sequestration. And that's because a lot of the carbon gets lost laterally through hydrologic exchange. And there's a lot of active research right now looking into whether or not we can count that in carbon markets. Is, is that carbon um, outflux being retained in oceans um, or not? And so um, just um, try and be as aware as we can of these blind spots um, and keep in mind that these could also emerge as you know, heterogeneity and just, again, emphasizing the need for continuous data sets um, over large spatial scales. Okay, so the last few slides of this is really informed by an article I helped co-author with a bunch of people from my field. Kim Novick um, led the opinion pace here in global change biology this year. But it's basically a bunch of people coming together and saying, okay, where are we with nature-based climate solutions? Um, and how can we best move forward using the best kind of best kind of science and, and tools? And so kind of the big take home message of this was that we're calling for the merging of traditional MRV methods with ecosystem scale or higher um, monitoring methods um, and combine those with remote sensing products and state of the art process based models. So this is a conceptual diagram from that piece just showing how you could have an area that you're monitoring with kind of traditional things like soil um, soil cores, tree inventories, and then eddy covariance data and remote sensing. And through merging of those different types of data streams, which all have, you know, their strengths and weaknesses and blind spots, right? Um, using the, all of that together to create um, carbon grids. Um, this is a, a figure I uh, borrowed from Stefan Metzger from NEON, one of my colleagues, um, who did this flux decomposition technique where you're basically taking um, eddy covariance data, remote sensing, and machine learning algorithms to create these time-sequenced kind of heat flux CO2 maps. Um, and these are the kind of data that we really need to push 
um, this field forward um, and, and merge it better with the science that's available, right? Um, and so we call here for creating these types of flux maps um, and creating them and giving them to policymakers and stakeholders who really need, you know, larger scale, more constrained um, assessments of the mitigation potential of these nature-based climate solutions. Um, and we emphasize here that we need to stack here all our different types of data sets, use our machine learning algorithms, create predictive models, and then run those to get these, these flux mats um, for the people who need them. Um, so we need to have um, spatially resolved data sets so we can more easily identify where is the potential greatest for greenhouse gas uh, mitigation, and then also using process-based modeling to allow us to do forward-looking and better assessments of permanence, because like I mentioned earlier, carbon markets um, do risk analyses to see, to assess permanence um, based on envi environmental factors like fire or flooding and things like that, but they often are not accounting for things like um, how carbon is stored under higher temperatures in the future or with higher concentrations of CO2. So those are the sort of things that Earth system models um, could really help and, um, again, bring this field forward, help move the field forward. I also wanted to emphasize the importance of, of inclusivity of solutions. So historically, um, and currently, developed nations, privileged communities are often disproportionately benefiting from the monetization of nature-based climate solutions and also the research funding. And so we call for, again, in this opinion article, um, more demographically diverse and representative research communities. This has been a, a problem in the geosciences for a long time. Um, I work at a minority serving institution and I have personally witnessed the power and strength of having diverse research teams and how that can help you come up with um, better and more equitable solutions and bring their perspectives from their communities. It can really enrich um, the scientific environment. And then finally, making sure that we're incorporating traditional knowledge and cultural values of the communities most affected by climate change, by pollution, by these mitigation projects themselves. So the people who are living adjacent to the wetland or whatever kind of the ocean, um, whatever region you're working in and making sure that we have that strong engagement and those strong ties. Um, so we're not making mistakes and overlooking things. Um, so yeah, so just to conclude, uh, Re-emphasize a few points here that um, MRV and carbon markets are really tricky to implement. There's a lot of room for improvement. We're just getting started in my eye. Um, there's really obvious problems with additionality, leakage, and permanence. But I think as we move forward and use uh, more state-of-the-art um, data and models, we also have to really keep an eye on um, spatial scales, heterogeneity, greater temporal resolution, making sure we're not missing biophysical feedbacks, um, unintended consequences, changes in water cycling or other nutrient cycling that we, we, we didn't anticipate, um, and also really making sure we're considering those who are most impacted, um, disadvantaged communities or communities of color, and moving into the future, we want to work on integrating lots of different types of data sets um, using machine learning, using remote sensing products and process-based models to make this as informed and um, knowledgeable and constrained as possible. Um, so that's it. That's my, that's my last slide. Thank you, guys. Panel discussion, which will come up at the end of the session. So for right now, I'm going to hold questions for Patty until the panel. Um, and welcome our next speaker, 
Uh, Simon Freeman uh, from the Department of Energy. Uh, Simon, I'll let you give an order to file yourself. Very complicated hybrid. It's just trying to get the mic to hear you better. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, thanks so much. So um, thanks everyone. Uh, my name is Simon Freeman. I'm a program director at RPE. Uh, I'm going to be speaking today about ocean-based CO2 removal measurement reporting and validation potential and next steps. And this is something that leads on from a program development workshop that we had in June this year. Um, I've tried to synthesize some of the feedback from the community there. Please uh, call me out if I'm mistaken in, um, in what I have deduced from, from everybody's input. I see a number of folks here who were present at that workshop. So um, I just want to start off before, before I get into the main presentation by telling you about what RPE actually is, because no one in the ocean science community really seems to know. Uh, RPE stands for the Advanced Research Projects Agency for Energy, like DARPA with a D, but it's DARPA with an E. Uh, we're part of the Department of Energy, and our mandate is to fund high risk, uh, potentially high reward, uh, transformative research in um, in the energy space. There we go. Sure thing. Awesome. Thanks. Uh, so we were formed in 2009, and uh, in 2021 we had a budget of roughly 420 million dollars. This year it's about 500 million. So uh, we are really into the idea of funding um, transformative technologies that uh, could enable a resilient energy infrastructure system for the United States, affordable, sustainable energy for all, and that also includes emissions mitigation. So that's why we're specifically interested in uh, CDR. And uh, my hope is to spin up a program at RPE in ocean carbon dioxide removal, specifically measurement reporting and validation technology. And that also fits into our mandate of, of uh, assisting with U.S. economic development and uh, um, maintaining American leadership in science and technology. So all of these things go together, and it's a uh, it's it, there's good rationale for RPE -E to be in this space. So uh, just want to start the presentation with this uh, slide on the left. I'm sure everyone's seen this before, but the uh, UN Environmental Programs summary on what we need to do to maintain a maximum of two degrees Celsius of global warming is uh, shown on the left there. Uh, they call for this rapid decarbonization of our industry through mostly conventional abatement, and there's some uh, emissions capture technologies there. But the thing that I'm interested in is that blue part at the bottom. So by 2050, we'll need to sequester roughly 5 to 10 gigatons of CO2 per year from the atmosphere, and by 2100, uh, 20 gigatons. And this is the enormous negative carbon industry that uh, has to happen. It hasn't happened yet, but um, you know, people talk about maybe it will, maybe it won't. It has to happen. Uh, and unfortunately, from our workshop, we uh, learned that the curve should really look more like this because you know, business as usual uh, is not business as usual. Our rate of emissions production is increasing. So consequently, to maintain this uh, temperature of two degrees or less um, above pre-industrial averages, we have to really create a very large negative emissions industry. And uh, you know, when we look at a picture of the earth on the right, uh, it's mostly ocean. And so I contend that uh, most of this carbon is gonna to need to be stored at sea or sequestered at sea. So hence my interest in marine carbon dioxide removal. And the scale is potentially enormous uh, or the, the, um, the scale of sequestration. So just pulling some data from the uh, National Academy of Sciences uh, ocean-based CDR report that they issued in December last year, 
uh, and just looking at two examples of CDR methods, you can see that at scale, these methods can could sequester gigatons or more in terms of um, carbon per year into the deep ocean or um, permanently on a hundred year time scale, let's say, into the ocean. And the costs are reasonable. So uh, artificial upwelling is estimated to gonna estimated to cost between 100 to 150 dollars a ton at the scale. Uh, iron fertilization potentially 25 to 50 dollars a ton. So the, the costs are fairly low. But even then, the magnitudes mean that the industry is going to be at least an $800 billion a year industry if we ever see it at scale. Now, I know that there are some caveats with these uh, types of CDR, but those are uh, putting those aside for a moment, I just want to give you this impression of how big this industry could potentially be. And you know, in it, MRV really matters. So the measurement and reporting and validation of carbon that is pulled down into the ocean um, is, in my view, critical to enable the industry. Uh, this quantification gives marine CDR financial value in a carbon market. Unless you know how much carbon you have drawn down with your system with a degree of certainty that's acceptable to the financial institutions, your technology is worth nothing. So, you know, just this fundamental paradigm of, of understanding the value is, is something that's going to be uh, satisfied by uh, the right MRV technology. And, uh, you know, this is MRV is the en enabler to scale this, these solutions that I've, I've put up here can reverse our existential climate disaster. So uh, this is to say it's not an academic exercise. It's not necessarily uh, about learning more about the ocean, although we will do so along the way. It's about creating a massive industry. So that should be the first thing in folks' minds in terms of you know, what is this all for? So uh, I just looked at the uh, sensing capabilities and platform capabilities available in oceanographic sciences today. And uh, we, we plotted them very approximately on this um, graph here with the horizontal axis is time scale and years, and then the vertical axis is spatial scale. And this sort of depicts the, the tyranny of, of time and distance, right? Um, as, as applied to the MRV problem. Uh, you have these various technological methods of sampling the ocean uh, or ocean sediments, um, but none of the spatial and temporal scales really overlap with the, uh, the, the spatial temporal scales of marine carbon dioxide removal processes. So um, you know, we see this as white space here. What if we could build sensors that could sense on the order of cubic kilometers um, for a long time, a year to 10 years? Uh, what if we could build platforms for the sensors that could remain at sea for a very long time, um, not just on the surface, like a sail drone, but at depth, at depths that are required to, to be, be evaluated for carbon flux. So uh, these are the questions that we're interested in RPE. Uh, my job is to always try to find these white spaces where nobody is working, but um, work is needed. And so this is where we think um, programs need to go. So. Going back to the National Academies report, which has been really a cornerstone of um, the work that we've been doing so far to really understand the problem, you know, they uh, detail six different methods of marine carbon dioxide removal. Uh, and I'm sure most of you have seen this report, so um, I won't really go into it in too much detail. But suffice to say, there are quotes here from the report that show that for each CDR method, you know, there's significant uncertainty. Um, and there's also well, about the performance of the method, you know, how effective is it in drawing down CO2, but also uh, uncertainty about the unintended consequences, which, you know, to some degree could be resolved with uh, an effective MRV system. So it, it's something that has a co-benefit there. You're ascertaining how much your CDR is worth, but you're also understanding what carbon fluxes look like in the ocean to a degree where you can potentially start to understand what some of the unintended consequences may be uh, associated with carbon fluxes. So uh, what would MRV look like? Or what does it need to satisfy? And uh, broadly speaking, we feel that uh, MRV needs to account for these four things. So firstly, you have to be able to measure the CO2 uh, accurately. So can the amount of CO2 removed be quantified, right? It's a fairly simple requirement, but it's often quite difficult, especially if you have a CDR technique that, you know, uh, creates multiple uh, carbon paths in the ocean. So for example, alkalinity enhancement, uh, you could potentially measure total alkalinity or pH, 
and you would be able to gauge a significant fraction of uh, the carbon drawn down by your enhancement technique. However, you know, adding, let's say, all of that limestone into these surface oceans is going to dramatically alter um, the, the makeup of phytoplankton in, in those waters. So what is that going to do to the biological carbon pump? There's a completely different carbon pathway there that you're also going to have to quantify. And if you didn't, you could actually be losing money because, you know, those plankton may be working for you to draw down more carbon, but, you know, you have no way of, of verifying that. So uh, measurability is, is more complicated than you think. Uh, verifiability is the second one. Can the CO2 be re CO2 removed be verified by somebody else? You know, you need some independent verification and validation there um, to gut check everybody and make sure no one is lying about how much carbon is being drawn down. And that adds substantially to the, uh, to the quality of the credit, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, additionality, are you, I think we saw, we, we heard a little bit about additionality in the last talk, but you know, there are natural processes in the ocean that um, uh, result in natural carbon fluxes. Are we actually adding to those or are we just looking at um, these natural processes themselves? And there's a lot of variability there. So that is also a challenging part of MRV. And the last part is durability. You know, how long is the carbon going to be sequestered for? How can we be sure? So uh, we feel like those are the four important parts of um, what would constitute a high quality MRV system. So you know, when we look at the situation today, there is a lack of accuracy for nature-based solutions. So when I say nature-based, I'm, I'm thinking about things like artificial upwelling, um, iron fertilization, ecosystem restoration, and so on. Not so much the electrochemical processes that are more cut and dry, but they're more expensive, right? Like um, direct ocean capture and direct air capture and so on. Um, so this uh, paper by Seymour Langer shows that they they feel the, the lack of accuracy um, is, is preventing um, nature-based solutions from being certified for the compliance market today. And they, they call out an accuracy, a lack of, uh, or an accuracy of measurement issue we need to ensure that reporting on emissions, reductions, and removals is, is accurate, and also significant uncertainty. So we need to ensure the risk of measurement errors is reduced. And uh, they say that in the compliance market, I mean, you or a voluntary group could purchase compliance offset market credits, but voluntary offset market credits, unless explicitly accepted into the compliance regime, aren't allowed to fill the compliance market demand, which means that these voluntary credits are not, the quality is not sufficient enough. They're not accepted into the compliance regime yet. So they're not allowed to be used to fulfill uh, market demand in the compliance market. And uh, as a result, they're worth much less. So this morning, Carlton Stimson, uh, a fellow from Booz Allen who uh, works with me at ARPA-E, was sending me text messages showing um, the prices for compliance um, credits and voluntary credits. There's about an order of magnitude difference where the compliance credits are about $80 and voluntary about eight. So, you know, that that uncertainty substantially reduces the value. And if you were a business creating a CDR industry, you know, it, it would be harder for you to, to make money if you could only get 10% of, of the, the value of your, your credits uh, compared to a, the compliance market credit. Uh, so on the right here, there's a, a, a plot from a McKinsey study too that sort of underlines this, uh, the, the cost of uncertainty and lack of accuracy. So this plot shows a snapshot of the practical potential of carbon credits by 2030. So you can't see it for the, the little screen up there, but it says by 2030, uh, these folks think that potentially we could, uh, the market could absorb perhaps eight to 12 gigatons of carbon sequestration per year. And that would be made up from, you know, nature avoided, uh, avoided nature loss, so 3.8 gigatons there, nature-based sequestration, 2.9 gigatons. And this is by 2030, so only eight years from now. Uh, and that would add to eight to 12. But they, the kicker on the right is that they think that today, the technologies are at a point where the supply that could enter the market is between one to five gigatons. And this massive section three to seven gigatons is, is denied to us by what they call mobilization challenges. And these are basically the, the risk of reversals. We don't know if that carbon is gonna stay out of the atmosphere, uh, the issue of permanence. The validation of the outcome, uh, you know, how, how accurate um, are these estimates of CDR, scalability, and also co corporate financial attractiveness. So 
how risk averse or how, how unwilling our corporations are to invest in these credits just because they're not sure how much they're worth. So the summary here is that without robust, low cost, scalable MRV, you know, these activities can't be, um, you know, can't assure positive climate impacts. You don't know how well your CDR system is going to be working and therefore the value is low and market adoption is, is hobbled because people are just not confident. So what I'm getting at here is, you know, MRV is really needed to enhance confidence in the fact that CDR is actually doing what it should be doing. Um, and there's actually some, some precedent here. And this was introduced to us by, by Alden Donnelly. Sorry, her head has been removed there. But uh, she's CEO of Nori, um, the carbon removal marketplace. And she came to our workshop in June and she mentioned, you know, this has happened before in the weather derivatives market. So the weather derivatives market is basically a, a, a market where um, folks can buy and sell financial instruments that are... Um, used to reduce risk associated with unexpected weather situations, right? So I've got this example of, of Hurricane Ian, um, you know, coming, um, striking Florida. You see all of these tracks from these um, different climate models or different weather models, so I should say. Uh, and there, there's inherently some randomness there. The weather systems are stochastic, just like ocean fluxes, right? But investors are comfortable with trading weather derivatives um, that have been developed from models like this because while there is error, that error is somewhat understood and it's based on physical principles. And these models have been matured uh, to the point where there's, the errors are as small as possible, they're still there, but at least they're known unknowns now. And so Alden's idea was that if we could create a situation like that for MRV, um, where the, the unknowns are present, but they're bounded, but we know why, um, then investment will follow. So. Uh, one other interesting point to make with the um, derivatives market is that um, there's no proof of loss provision, which is, you know, you, you don't have to prove that your building was destroyed by this hurricane. All you have to show is that, so it's just here, settlement is objective. All you have to show is, say, the eye of the storm came within 50 miles of your building. And, you know, if it did, you get paid out. Um, and that chosen weather index or that that rule is with is the data driven metric. So statistically, if the eye came within 50 miles of your building, you know it's 95% likely your building would be destroyed. So that, that's one example. Um, so everything is probabilistic, it's data driven, and it's um, you know the more accurate you can be with your data, the more money you would make as a derivatives trader. So there's an incentive to be accurate there, like a tremendous financial incentive. And you know lastly, this the weather um, the weather derivatives market is quite large in the U.S. The weather related risk the economy is valued at two to nine trillion that was a figure i found from 2000 so you know it, it should be much more than this by now so um just changing topic a little bit to the terrestrial to terrestrial solutions in the voluntary carbon market today um just looking quickly at it it looks like the vcm in 2022 93 percent avoidance credits only a little bit in terms of removal credit so avoidance means you know um your company switches to electric cars. So you avoid emitting the CO2. Therefore, potentially you could gain credits for that, right? Versus removals, you know, I planted some trees. So uh, that's the difference. But in 2030, that's, that should be 30 there, uh, things will flip. So more than half um, of the, uh, the, the voluntary market in, in 2030 is projected to be uh, going to be based on removals. And that includes direct air capture, if you noticed in the IRA, there's a significant provision for direct air capture at the moment. Um, I have my opinion on what they missed, but you know, this is how it is now. Um, and it's not a bad thing. So uh, you know, we're projected to really start looking at removals as a viable method um, for, for obtaining carbon credits. However, you know, there's a significant limiting factor here where most of the removals are land-based. So just looking at um, afforestation, it's a pretty inexpensive method of, of carbon dioxide removal, 10 to $20 per ton of CO2. And you know we may need between 70 and 225 gigatons of CO2 by 2050 is the question. But if that was solely fulfilled by afforestation, uh, we would need all the land on earth. So you know there's a lot of scaling issues associated with these terrestrial techniques. And if you look at today's um, current CO2 removals in the voluntary carbon market, two thirds are afforestation and reforestation. These are the least expensive. They're, they're the most sort of doable. 
and potentially the easiest to perform MRV on, but there's an issue of scale there. Um, survey across um, these stakeholders involved in the voluntary carbon market have found that has found that most people want more guidance, increased protocol, and um, sort of increased sort of um, sort of regulatory um, frameworks surrounding technical removals. So they want more information. They want more bounds so that the industry becomes more regulated. And uh, you know, looking at this, uh, the, the results of the survey here. Challenges identified at the voluntary carbon market uh, from stakeholders again. The top two responses were the quality of carbon credits were uncertain and the carbon accounting uncertainties. So these are both to do with the uncertainties of MRV. And um, I just wanted to, to emphasize that it's not just me, like the industry is calling for this. And this is the terrestrial uh, voluntary carbon market at the moment. So um, moving on to what we think should be done in the ocean. Um, this is just a summary of the National Academy's report. Um, they detailed, they, they looked into six different methods of CDR in the ocean. And, uh, you know, you've got this high level overview of what the costs may be at scale, the estimated area that may be required to survey, um, the depth to which surveys would need to be conducted, and then the duration. So how long, you know, we would need to, to spend time in the ocean uh, or potentially Know, take data to ensure that our models were correct. So just looking at this at a very high level, you can see that for MRV to be successful in the ocean, it needs to be inexpensive because every dollar that MRV costs is going to be added to that number, right? Uh, it's going to have to survey large areas at depth for a long time. So this is the dream, cheap, large space, deep, long time. And uh, I mean, you could say this, it's, this, these are desirable characteristics for any oceanographic application, but you know, th this is the challenge that we face today. And so we think that you know, what's needed for a new economy in ocean sensing for MRV is that we really need to reduce uh, CapEx through a number of um, technology-based methods, you know, looking at um, economies of scale, so producing things on mass, very low cost per unit, um, reduced material usage, multi-sensor integration. You know, this is really just scaling the industry, going from say, the bespoke automotive industry in the 1920s to uh, the Model T Ford. I think something like that we think needs to happen. And then this idea of reducing dependency on crewed vessels. So reducing the costs of operational expenditure for at sea data collection. I mean, we already do this to some degree with some autonomous systems, but as I showed at the beginning, you know, that white space still exists. And you know, I can get on my soapbox about this, the blue economy, and you know, I call it the unrequited love of the blue economy, right? Like in the 1950s, Cousteau, if you watch his old documentaries, would say things like, oh, the ocean doesn't ask volume for 20 billion people to live and, and grow all their food. 70 years later, why hasn't this happened? It's because it's too expensive to send people to sea. And, you know, to, and the, the solution to that is autonomy. So uh, you remove the people, you can reduce the cost per day to go and collect your data and potentially you know, transform uh, ocean economies that way. So, uh, and then the last point, uh, we need trusted models. So this data that is collected needs to be integrated into uh, models that require less frequent and lower spatial res resolution measurements over time. So like weather models, as they become more and more accurate, you need less validation, they become less expensive. Um, so there's a real feed forward cycle there. So just looking very quickly at um, ocean parameters relevant to MRV, this is a table that we've tried to collect regarding the state of the art in terms of the parameters that we think are directly relevant to um, CDR MRV in the ocean. And uh, you can see that uh, the accuracies, the methods, and then uh, unit cost. And these costs are fairly high per sensor, especially if you need sort of thousands of them. Um, and uh, a lot of these technologies do not benefit from economies of scale. Um, and the other kicker is that, you know, there's an equation that the CO2 dissolution equilibrium equation on the top right there, um, you can measure certain parameters there to get some idea of the dissolved inorganic carbon flux in the ocean. Um, but uh, there are significant other pieces uh, in terms of dissolved organic carbon and particular organic carbon that you would also need to measure simultaneously. So, uh, just moving forward now to what we think are the solutions, we need uh, 
technical progress in three different areas. We think that sensors, the paradigm of ocean sensing needs to be shifted towards um, from something that looks inward. So you have these control volumes where water is ingested and a, a precise analysis is done to something that looks outwards. So think about sonar, but instead of carbon, or instead of sound, think carbon. I'm not saying that's possible, but that's the sort of idea here. And then inexpensive, regular, reliable full ocean access. Um, in terms of platforms, we have some persistent platforms today, but um, not at depth. We have certain components that prevent depth capability or only allowed at great cost. And uh, as I mentioned before, economies of scale. And then lastly, with models, we think that mature MRV is going to be conducted primarily through modeling of real CDR approaches and with some validation from, from data sets that are collected in a limited way. And that's really just to drive down the cost of MRV. Um, we think that um, developing models with accuracy in quantity and permanence are the key metrics. Potentially they, could be, potentially, they could be developed best with next generation sensors and platforms. And uh, the idea here is to you know, reduce the model error and uncertainty and that's inversely proportional to investor and market confidence. So, um, you, you know, we see at a very high level this emphasis on remote sensing that is not using chemistry-based sensors, but say electromagnetic, acoustic, and optical sensors. Uh, we see unprecedented assimilation of large data sets in iterative CDR model development. So these swath style sensors co can collect terabytes per day, you know, enormous quantities of data. Um, we could use those to feed models that are far more accurate than what we have today. Uh, so uh, this is just a quick slide about how the voluntary carbon market uh, is showing that demand is coming. So the McKinsey study shows that the BCM may be worth 30 to 50 billion by 2030. This is a high end estimate, but the uh, adoption of carbon credits or the demand for carbon credits is nonlinear at the moment. So anyway, um, I wanna leave you with one quote here. Um, people don't really stop doing things that they like, even if they know what they're doing is bad for them. A society by nature tends to surplus its way out of problems. And this is a quote by a friend of mine, John Markowitz. He's a political science professor at USC. But what he's saying is basically, you can't force people to not emit. You have to give them the opportunity to become wealthy by not emitting or by capturing. So people tend to surplus their way out of problems. And that's, that's the way that we can get society to change. So I thought that his opinion was pretty, pretty interesting there. And um, you know, I, I'm always interested in speaking to you about technology-driven ideas on, on how we can enable MRV. Uh, please keep in touch. Thanks. So we're going to move uh, from here right into our session one panel. So if you're an in-person panelist, go ahead and come on down. Uh, we offered the opportunity to all of our panelists um, to briefly introduce themselves, either uh, using slides or just speaking. These are going to be really quick. Panelists online and in the room, as you introduce yourselves, uh, please be quick. Uh, if you are in person, please uh, grab a seat at the table. Uh, if you are online, we are actually, uh, I think, going to start with you uh, in terms of introductions. Uh, 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 who, which of our panelists is virtual right now? Stephanie, why don't you start? Hi, everyone. Hopefully you can hear me. I did have some slides that I added to the Google Slides. Great. Just one second. I'll I'll start moving through them. You can tell me where to stop. So I can't actually see the screen oh. from online. Um, You're up, Stephanie. It looks good. That sounds good. Right, Thank you so much. <laughs> you should have them just a sec. Can you see them? Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
So thank you very much for inviting me here today. My name is Dr. Stephanie Arcusa. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at Arizona State University in the Center for Negative Carbon Emissions. And I work on advancing the certification of carbon removal, regardless of the reservoir. So my colleagues and I have surveyed the space of the certification of carbon removal to identify who certifies what type of removal using what standard. And the result is this map, which is very complex and has many actors that have designed over 150 protocols worldwide. And at the time of the data collection, we found almost no standard that existed for marine-based removal, as shown here in the red box. And this is obviously a rapidly evolving space, and we, have may, may, we may have missed some standards, so it's likely to have already been outdated. So if you could go to the next slide, please. So standards are created because we wish to sell removed carbon as a commodity that represents neutralization of an emission. However, for that to be true, all the standards would need to produce the same output. And all standards, we need to guarantee a permanent removal, which is measured in hundreds of thousand years and not decades or centuries. And for either of those conditions to be true, the outputs of the standards would need to be verifiable, which means they would need to be measurable. But this is not the case today. Standards all differ. They produce all different outputs. One reason being that no universal guidelines currently exist for standard development for carbon removal. And instead, the standards are following the practices that have been used for emission reduction and avoidance. Yet carbon removal is fundamentally different. The barriers, there are barriers that stop us from reaching this commodity model. We must move away from the use of subjective methodologies. We must start creating the, uh, treating the differences in the expected storage durations in a way that actually provides equal footing. We must have a scientific definition of permanent storage. We must start filling the missing scientific information that we've heard so much about already. And we must start making value-based decisions with the public. And if all of this sounds too challenging, then there is an alternative to the commodity model. And this is to just encourage removal for the sake of removal and not to make claims of neutralization. Next slide, please. And that's because claiming neutralization really requires that carbon accounting methodologies tell us how much is stored and that it is stored permanently. So, I have some of the questions that I think the marine science com community really ought to think about answering, uh, both on the topic of measurements and on the topic of permanence. Happy to discuss all of this further. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Stephanie. Uh, is, are any of our other panelists virtual? Hi. This is Nora. Can you see and hear me? If you want to go ahead, Nora. Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm Nora Cohen Brown. I'm the head of market development and policy at Charm Industrial. And I want to say thank you to Jessica and Jamie and the rest of the organizing team for inviting me to be part of today's meeting. Um, as scientists, you all are the gatekeepers for making sure that CDR happens responsibly. And I know that many of you are concerned about the quality and the measurement of carbon removals. And that's a concern that as a, at a, as a practitioner, we share as well. And it's really central to our work at CHARM to develop high quality MRV methods. This market can't develop without a science-based approach to making sure that the quality of removals is high. Um, CHARM is a leader in the emerging CDR field and to date has permanently removed more carbon than any other permanent removal company that we are aware of. We have removed 5,400 um, tons of carbon in 2021, which is, of course, a tiny drop in the bucket, but certainly is, you know, progress in this emerging field. Um, CHARM removes carbon by using a process called pyrolysis to convert waste biomass feedstocks like corn stover and forest forestry residue into a carbon-rich bio-oil. We then transport our bio oil to an end of life injection location like a salt cavern or disposal well. And once it's injected underground, it actually hardens pretty quickly and stays permanently sequestered. We, um, after we completed our first removal in 2021, what we found quickly is that there really wasn't an MRV framework or a certification body that was a good fit for our methodology. 
Um, the way that we verified our very first removal was with um, our customer Stripe was to actually have a FaceTime conversation between the person at the injection well um, and our customer. So we know that that is not you know, a scalable way to do MRV. And because there wasn't a methodology to do this, we took matters into our own hands and started consulting with experts and consultants to develop a prototype protocol. Um, so we just a couple of months ago released this prototype protocol for the voluntary market. And we also um, established a public registry on our website that actually shows the life cycle analysis for every ton that we've removed. Um, this prototype, which we developed with a consultant called Eco Engineers and with Carbon Direct and their scientific experts, um, it takes into account each step of the process for bio oil. So everything from, um, you know, how the biomass is produced and collected to, you know, transportation to um, the injection process. And we also sought feedback on this from a dozen nonprofit and academic partners to make sure that our approach was accurate and really took into account every kind of boundary condition. Um, for us, we're fortunate because DOE has done a ton of work on biofuels, so we're able to use the GREAT model and some other um, research to support the biomass side of our process and then also the geologic um, storage experience from the oil and gas industry. Um, and then the other thing is that bio oil itself, it really does harden. Like we have these images from our core samples in which you can see like this, you know, it's like a really gooey substance that then um, at a certain temperature, it, it's very, very solid, right? So I think that that is helpful to us because there is such a, um, you know, it's measurable, but also, you know, it, there's still a lot of work to be done for us and others. And our goal really is to set a standard and establish a roadmap for the industry for both MRV and transparency around the permanence of removals. Thanks a lot, Nora. I wanna remind everyone that Patty is also a virtual panelist uh, in this particular session, but as we've heard from her already this morning, um, we'll move on to our next panelist, Patrick Duke. Thanks so much, uh, Jess. Uh, my name is Patrick Duke. I'm a PhD student at the University of Victoria. I'm using machine learning to estimate air sea CO2 fluxes in the Northeast Pacific. And I'm here to really advocate for sort of the position and the space that early career scientists are going to play in this as we move towards this $200 billion industry. And I think the expertise and training that we need to develop and invest in as we move into this space and the demand increases is really on our early career sort of ocean professionals, both in the science and academic space, as well as in sort of the not-for-profit conservation uh, space as well. So this is actually a paper that we have submitted to Canadian Science Publishing uh, with all early career authors that are really outlining sort of where we are in Canada in addressing the challenges uh, that we're facing in sort of the marine CDR upstart on the air CO2 flux side, additionality, but also what we're asking for in training and capacity building. And I think groups like OCB are doing a great job, but we'd love to see more of this internationally, because as we sort of build out these MRV uh, procedures and components, sharing this with communities that maybe don't have the same investment uh, to develop it themselves really need to get access to what we're developing here and what we're investing in. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, in sort of addressing the additionality component in this sort of synthesis paper that we have, we've sort of laid out a couple air sea fluxes that are uh, measured or reported in a number of different basins across Canada. And I think really the important piece here is understanding that additionality takes a, a lot uh, and really beating down the natural variability from a handful of different estimates is going to be key in this. Uh, and like we just saw um, with the sort of white space between what sensors are capable of doing and what marine CDR approaches are actually looking at, uh, there's a lot of different approaches that we hope can fill those in the intersection that Jess sort of talked about with uh, neural network and machine learning estimates, as well as models and high resolution models uh, being sort of all integrated as tools to really beat this down is something that we're, we're sort of pushing for. But I think the last sort of piece here is really looking at where these fluxes are taking place, particularly in Canada, is mostly along uh, coastal systems that are occupied by Indigenous and First Nations communities that are sort of have historically systemically been oppressed. And as we sort of move into this space, we really need to be consulting early and often with those communities on how these things are moving forward, including the MRV, which we feel like we have sort of a very science bias to. But as we move into more sort of project feasibility, scalability testing, these communities are really at the forefront of this. And that is sort of the diverse voice in the room that we're really pushing to include uh, early and often. Patrick, Matt. 
Hi, everybody. I'm Matt Eisman from Stony Brook University, and also I'm CTO and co-founder of Ebb Carbon. And thanks for organizing. Can you hear me? Yeah. Thanks for organizing this wonderful meeting. Um, and just, just a couple of slides. This just um, meant to talk about how we're thinking about MRV now at Ebb. So what Ebb is doing is taking existing waste brine aqueous streams, for example, from a desalination plant as one example, and using electrochemistry um, to create alkalinity that is added to the ocean. And so right now, our MRV strategy is what we call 3M, right? So measure, monitor, and model. So the measure part is, um, is sort of the easy part for us. So we're generating aqueous sodium hydroxide solution so we can use sensors on the electrochemical system itself to just measure very accurately um, the rate of alkalinity generation and the rate at which we're adding alkalinity back to the ocean. Um, the second piece is monitoring uh, near the point of dispersal. So just characterizing uh, the carbonate chemistry uh, near the site of dispersal for two reasons. One, we use that as a feedback to our system to make sure we're uh, within safe bounds. And then um, second, just to make sure that the, the uh, chemistry is responding in the way we would anticipate with that rate of alkalinity addition. And then the third piece is we rely on models then uh, to model and calculate the, the CO2 removal as a result of that alkalinity addition. And so, you know, moving forward, what is what does it look like? What are we hoping for in our goals for MRV in the future? It's really taking that monitoring piece and moving it spatially further and further away. As people have mentioned, because of the slow CO2 equilibration time, by the time CO2 is largely removed, things have dispersed to the point where it's hard to measure. So if you could go to the next slide. This is just sort of a vision of what maybe we hope it looks like in the future. Thanks to Hongji for letting me steal uh, this figure from our paper as a backdrop. Um, so this is just imagining a, an alkalinity um, dispersal in the Bering Sea. That's the red dot. And then the orange dots are just um, a sensor network. And these red lines are meant to show essentially the detectable limit, right? So how far away from that alkalinity addition that we could directly measure the CO2 removal and the hope that, you know, as the years go on, that line gets further and further away because what those lines really represent are, in, you know, the further that line is from the alkalinity addition point, the larger the fraction of CO2 that's been removed that we directly detect instead of rely on model. Um, how do we do that? It's shown on that list on the left. So first I say, quote, better sensors. Simon talked a bit about that. Um, but I think it's important to point out the sensor, the constraints on the sensors for this problem are different and make it a little bit easier, right? So it's not a standard oceanographic sensor where we just say, I want to know the exact value, the true value of this parameter at this location, but rather the question is really conditional on a known alkalinity release and can, you know, location and, and rate and conditional on what our models say should happen and conditional on the baselining that we've done with the sensor network what is the probability that the data measured by that sensor network is consistent with X percent of, or X amount of carbon removed, right? So sort of to that point of the, the weather derivatives and thinking about it probabilistically. Um, the second one is better models. People who know more about that will talk more about that at this meeting, but I think, you know, some of the aspects are spatial, uh, spatial resolution and then also integrating um, these, the data from these networks. Um, and then the third one is actually on companies like Ebb, which is you can think about how to be smart about how you release the alkalinity to make verification easier and how you treat that alkalinity prior to remove, prior to dispersal uh, to make direct verification easier. And then finally, I think a point we probably all agree upon is always making sure the data, the models, and how we get to the calculated CO2 removal is fully transparent so that others can come and, and look at that data and make their own calculations and verify. And even in, in the future, we could go back in time and see how that was done kind of in the early days. So, thanks. Thanks, Matt. Colin, did you have thoughts? Nope. Okay. I'm trying to keep this, kind of, I was trying to keep this quick, but actually uh, I think you've probably seen most of the slides that I was shown anyway, because some of them were in Simon's talk. Uh, my name is Calden Simpson. I'm the Booz Allen Hamilton supporting uh, ARPA E specifically around uh, 
the Smart Farm Program, which is why I was brought on about a year ago into that position. But um, I'll first start by telling you that I am absolutely about as far away removed as you can be from uh, the ocean space and the marine space. And I think I'm really here just to help, uh, you know, kind of weigh some of the possibilities against what we've learned in the terrestrial space and then maybe bring in some of my expertise in uh, field trials, data simulation, and doing, um, you know, it's kind of measures plus models, marrying and integration that everybody talks about here. Um, I got my PhD in physical organic chemistry in 2011. I had a postdoc at Scripps, which means I got real close to being at the ocean, but it was the Research Institute for Supermolecular Chemistry and Self-Assembly. Um, moved away from that and actually uh, went and started my own company because we had stumbled across this um, small molecule that I had built in during my uh, doctoral research that was sensitive to nitrate. And we could use that to monitor nitrate in soil pore water and groundwater. And so we wanted to use that to monitor nitrate and the nitrate problem within ag. Um, that would allow us to kind of get at the root of the nitrous oxide emissions process. Um, built that company from about 2012 to 2016 when I sold it to the Climate Corporation, moved on to the Climate Corporation because I'm really bad at business and I accidentally tied myself to that license. So um, had to be there for about, I think, four years would have been, um, you know, my tenure uh, to help start this measures models process and, and build a, a field trial team as well as a new tech prospecting team to help build out there. Um, the parameterization of the, of the tools that they were using to help growers do decision support um, for all of their processes. Um, you know, once Monsanto reorganized climate and then Bear bought Monsanto, it gave me the opportunity to go back out into the, uh, um, into the free world <laughs> of startups. And uh, I started working with some companies doing uh, wildfire and smoke tank monitoring and mitigation for grapes and other high volume crops in Northern California. Um, that really got me into the carbon space. I got excited about the carbon space and was headhunted into the position that I'm in today to start looking and do a, uh, a little bit more what I'm calling continuing education for myself in, in the carbon space. I can look around the room and see from some of the terrestrial carbon workshops that I've been involved with at RPE over the last year, as well as the marine workshop, that there are people in the audience that know so much more than me about this space. I think I see Korea there nodding your head. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, but I think what I'm here to say is, you know, in general, my job is really to focus on uh, asking the really dumb questions and then, you know, um, having people kind of, you know, test why it's a dumb question with me. Um, and I think that, you know, one of the things that I, it really boils down to within this space, and I, and I ran into this as, as an academic myself and then to the, with the academics that I uh, manage programs for and work with today, which is sometimes we just got to do it. We can't let the enemy be the purpose of the good, right? And, and I think that that's uh, an approach that might be useful for some of the more well-bounded processes that we could test instantiate and then test within the marine space. Now, I'm not a proponent of just dumping a ton of stuff everywhere and seeing how it works, but I do think that we need to at least start to build bounding boxes around some of these processes so that we can get a better handle on you know, what the possibility is. In fact, that's where the innovation really comes from, right? If we try a process that we kind of know won't work, but we get almost all the way there, that little bit of white space, that last bit is where the innovation really happens, where we can then have you know, somebody reach across the aisle with a new technology that allows us to make it that last little mile that we need to go. Um, and I think the other major point to make here um, that, that, that I'm probably here to talk about is, is twofold. I think of um, everything within the ag space and within the carbon space is less about dollars and value in a credit and more about our energy budget, like the mass heat and mass balance, right? Just how, what are we investing in it from a human perspective and what are we getting back out of it? And dollars are a good representation of that, I guess. But, um, you know, really we shouldn't be talking solely about carbon. We should be talking about radiative forcing. Um, so we just want to make sure that we keep that in mind as we talk about this stuff. And I'm more than happy to sit here and ask more dumb questions of all of you to help spur the conversation forward. Uh, I actually want to start uh, a little bit of the conversation uh, called in by talking to you um, and Patty a little bit more. Since both of you have worked in the land carbon and the soil carbon space for so long, you have some concept of how uh, these MRV standards develop over time. Uh, so we heard a little bit from Patty about the difference between a voluntary market and the difference between a compliance market. Um, uh, but I wonder if you could talk about essentially gated growth. Uh, how do we balance the participants participation of people in this market by, you know, against the quality uh, of the offsets that are actually there. What does that growth look like over time? What does that process look like over time? Uh, so we'll start in the room with Calden and then Patty, if you want to respond to that. Yeah, I think I'd start to answer that question from the perspective of um, sort of communal tools and scalability. So, um, you know, one of the things I think Patty knows probably a lot more than me about, once again, is the Ameriflex network. So we've got this, this great network of, of, of tools and monitoring technologies within the eddy covariance space um, that we make use of within smart farms. So when we're doing field trials, we have yet another sort of 
what I would consider from an in-situ, you know, strip trial, field trial basis, we have this sort of global monitoring process that we can do for that whole field uh, with respect to that very targeted uh, experiment that we're doing. And I think that bridging that scale gap, figuring out how what happens at one point in, say, a field on the terrestrial side, or if we're talking about the marine space, what happens in maybe one bay or inlet where some of these, process, these processes are happening, then can, you know, flow out to the rest of the global system is a really... It's going to go a long way to build trust in our understanding of the system and our ability to do that accounting without double counting things, right? And a better understanding of the leakage and, and reversals and the other things that may be happening sort of concurrent with that process. To keep it a little bit more positive, though, I think on the other side of things, what we do see from some of these types of technologies is a better understanding sometimes of the ecosystem services value that we get out of this, right? Like we think of in the terrestrial and soil carbon space, carbon being captured and sequestered in the soil is a good thing. Where I disagree with some folks is I don't think that that necessarily can be a carbon capture process in and of itself. I think it more it's foundational to a lot of the other processes that happen and that exist so that it lowers inputs globally for whether or not we're doing food agriculture or uh, you know, bioeconomic agriculture for low carbon fuel standard or whatever else, mm -hmm. right? So it becomes this more global approach that then if we can measure, monitor, and define what a good process within those bounds looks like. Then we do yet another, you know, uh, a good job of, of of making that um that process more transparent and then more trustable. Um, and then lastly, you know, since I mentioned Ameriflux, I think there is this big concern with data, data privacy. We start to see people right now already talking about how there are some maybe more in unscrupulous um, uh, companies using some of this publicly available data to reduce their own scope three emissions just by saying, hey, this is happening within our supply chain, even though it had nothing to do with that process. It's just publicly available data. I don't know how widespread that. That problem is, don't quote me on that, but it's something that we hear anecdotally, right? So that, that boils back down to not just doing sort of a scientific understanding of the scale gap, but providing some sort of transparency through the whole data process and coming up with communal tools that people have access to, that people know how to essentially query and get an answer back from. Mm -hmm. And that we as scientists, and well, kind of an ex-scientist since I hardly ever get to work at the bench, or at the bench anymore, um, can actually help, you know, with input data too, and have other people be able to visualize and see that and see that change for themselves. Um, that, that kind of trust is really probably important in this, in this space. Patty, beginning of MRV versus mature or end game MRV. What do you think sort of the arc of that development is gonna look like? Yeah, um, well, one thing that kind of brings to mind, I wanted to mention, I, I don't think I forgot to mention this, but in the California compliance market, what they're really looking for are methodologies that have been implemented successfully in the voluntary carbon market and seem to be, um, you know, really viable projects, uh, reputable um, verifications, things like that. And so, like I said, our our protocol was, um, written in and adopted in 2016 and now in 2021, you know, five years later, after it's been in the voluntary market for five years, CARB comes in and says, oh, maybe we should adopt this into comp compliance market. They're very, um, you know, conservative and cautious about that, uh, making sure, you know, we've had uh, Department of Water Resources, you know, state governments that are using the protocol um, so I feel like it's a pretty rigorous uh, protocol, and even then, it, it's taking just a very, very long time um, to be adopted and to be to be used. And um, you know, the compliance market is really where the the value of the carbon is is higher, and and therefore makes it you know more viable as like a way of really increasing wetland restoration in California. Um, but yeah, so I think. Um, you know, early on, a lot of these protocols are very niche, you know, some of the data streams are expensive, um, they're hard to access, you need very um, niche knowledge of how to collect the data. And then slowly, you know, as our speakers have talked about, you know, the data become more plentiful, they're easier to collect sensors get cheaper, you get these open access data networks like Ameriflux and things like that. You start getting these gridded flux maps and things. And so I, I kind of feel like that's kind of the arc of it I see in with, with regard to the science side. I don't, I don't know if I answered your question, but. 
<laughs> you did. Um, and that actually leads me uh, into what's going to be our open discussion with all of the panelists and then as well as the rest of the room. And so keeping in mind what we've heard about these concepts of MRV, um, you know, what the beginning of MRV looks like versus the end, what it takes to get from the beginning towards the end. Um, there are, uh, you know, all kinds of things that we know that we need, but also all kinds of information products that the market incentivizes over others for good and for bad. Uh, and so that's what I want to open up um, the panelists that we have here to talk about a little bit. You know, what is your concept of like useful information products? How do we create the information products? Products that are going to support MRV, you know, are those really the ones that the market cares about? You know, does the ones that the market care about actually have anything to do with the kind of data that we can collect? Because sometimes, you know, those two things are in conflict with each other. Uh, so uh, we'll start if anybody wants to chime in virtually, and then we'll we'll move uh, to the in person folks here. Okay, uh, hearing none. Anybody? Oh, sorry. Here? I was just oh, going to go say. Ahead, I was just going to say one thing too that we did with all all of our eddy covariance data that we collected in in the San Francisco Bay Delta was we built a process based model. Um, so we use model data fusion to create like a really simple um, process based model that was rigorous, but it was driven through like really accessible inputs and drivers like air temperature, things you can just get from like local weather stations, soil carbon maps that are publicly accessible. And then we put that on a website that, you know, is it's run through R, but it's you can you can access it online just through your browser. And so I think that's one way that's a, a nice way of kind of like collecting the high quality data, merging it into a model framework, and then making like an online GUI. I think that was kind of the approach we took. Yeah, turning data into information and then making that information accessible. Um, I like the slide that you showed, by the way, that uh, uh, essentially said what we need are these really nice high level maps. So however it is that you create a map, the map is the thing that gets used. Matt, you highlighted that uh, a little bit in the paper figure that you showed from Han Shi with the uh, sensor array. Again, it's the map is what people actually want to see. Um, uh, other folks on the panel, what data products? Any thoughts about data products that support MRV? Simon, I know this is near and dear to your heart, so I'd be surprised if you didn't chime in. You need, you need a mic. Whenever I see those maps, I'm I'm so jealous of the satellite remote sensing world because you know their fluid is is perfectly clear. Um, it's, it's actually clear hyperspectrally. You know, um, the problem is still challenging for them, but at least they can see what's going on at a large scale. And um, you know, fundamentally, the, this this problem under the under the water, once carbon is, is like subducted under the surface beyond the first optical depth, you have um, you know, you really need to follow it for some period of time until it ultimately potentially gets to some recalcitrant state and as part of C4 sediment, at least below some sort of uh, uh, qualifying depth to qualify the uh, So um, creating spatial, time evolving spatial um, databases for um, these parameters that I discussed is, is absolutely the way to go. Um, there'll be errors associated with these measurements, just like anything, um, but really sort of creating a situation where we can almost treat the ocean as transparent would be would be the sort of ideal case uh, for at least ocean-based CPR processing. And hopefully we can do that um, with some like improvements in technology. In some ways that has already been done. Uh, you know, I, I, in the Navy, I, I used to work as an oceanographer for the Navy, um, there was a, a paradigm called transparent ocean, but the term was cooked up by some admiral and for a decade or so, folks would try to build acoustic sensors to, to um, adhere to this principle. And it, it was successful. So, um, you know, at the beginning of that, people weren't sure how it was going to happen. But by the end, the capabilities were, were fundamentally sort of game changing. So um, I'm hoping something like that can happen with, um, with carbon fluxes this time, as opposed to just acoustic. Thanks, Simon. Uh, any other? Anybody else want to chime in? Yeah, I'll just jump in to say, uh, beyond the actual observational platforms, the actual data analysis is also critical in actually pulling apart where that influence and impact is. And just to plug, I saw Adrian Sutton had 
a question in the chat. So she popped up, but she actually has a paper coming out about the time series analysis for detectable trends with anthropogenic signals, but also that could easily tie into looking at where the marine CDR is actually taking place. Just a, a quick comment that now is the time to baseline, right? So maybe we can think about likely deployment locations for different uh, marine CDR and really try and get high quality, high resolution baseline data before um, before a lot of things hit the ground. Yeah, thanks. I, oh yeah, I uh, arrived here and, and shared this trip with a trip to the IBM Watson campus uh, just north of New York City yesterday. And we had a really long discussion about um, data silos and searchability and key value pair searching and all these things that kind of lower the you know computational load that we that we have currently, even with the siloed data that we have today. And I think you know in in my role here is kind of a cautionary tale for some of the stuff that we've done in the terrestrial world. I'd say that you know we're, we we do have some great white space, or I guess we should start using the blue ocean strategy thing here since we are talking about marine you know carbon. Uh, <laughs> but we have some great white space here for for uh, um, you know really focusing now on how we handle the large sets of data that we're going to end up with, right? Um, making it more searchable, making it easier to store, making sure that we're not leaving them little data islands and data deserts, um, you know, scattered about as we do, uh, as we do this sort of uh, MRV and, and sensor development uh, process. Um, I think, you know, as anybody who's ever worked with a lot of field data in, in the past um, has probably found, you can never sort of, you know, forecast exactly what type of metadata you're going to need to associate it with. Um, exactly, you know, how you're going to want to store it so that you can search it back up later or make sure that you can cross-reference it with some new technology that you're now working on. Um, and I think we should probably forget about that ever being perfect. But if we at least give it a lot of thought now and have somebody thinking about what that architecture looks like, um, what the schema need to look like and how we can make sure that we share that, I think we get a long way there. The last bit's the hardest though, and who's the person that's, you know, or, or the entity or the group that um, is in charge of storing and curating that data. Um, that's another another story altogether, but uh, I think we got some more people in the room. Uh, so I'm going to ask one more question, and then I'm going to open it up to the room and to the folks online. So be thinking of any questions that you want to ask of our panel. We're going to go until about 1050 um, and eat into the break just a little bit, and then we will make up that time and we'll start on time again with our next session. Uh, but just last question to the panel, and I have to uh, tip my hat to Brendan Carter, who typed this uh, into the chat, um, called in what you were just saying, Matt, what you were just saying, you know, now is the time to get started. If you could get anything out of this workshop this week, what do you hope that we accomplish by Friday? Two sentences. We're going to start with people online. Patty, what do you wish that we would do this week? Um, yeah, I mean, I would, I would say that coming up with like, at least like a framework of where, how to move forward, maybe, I mean, I think you mentioned before, like a white paper or something like that, or an opinion piece, but sort of, I think it, it's important for the community to come together and identify these, you know, white spaces or whatever it is. And, um, um, you know, make that roadmap. I think that's what we are trying to do with our global change biology paper. Nice. Thanks. Nora, what do you wish that we accomplish by the end of the week? What I would say is from an industry perspective, from, you know, many of the buyers in this industry want there to be really good MRV and the companies want to achieve that as well. So I think what, you know, the thing that's required is a framework from the science community about how to achieve that and, you know, support for the industry to ensure that there's, you know, a pathway to figure out some of these hard problems and to continue to question them. So I think thinking through, you know, if, if we can achieve some frameworks for these things that help um, push that forward and have the scientific community on board to say, yes, we will help figure this out. I think that that's really important to the growth of the market. Stephanie. Um, I think I could echo everything that's been said already. And I'd probably add that from the perspective of creating a commodity model, I think two of the main questions that really need to be answered, and the first one has been talked at length, it's what is the data that is necessary to prove that the CDR is actually storing the carbon we're saying it is storing? And then the second part, which has been talked about a little bit, um, but also plays an important role in carbon accounting is the, the permanence issue. 
and what are the scientifically credible ways to prove that this that the carbon is actually being stored for those timescales that are necessary for climate mitigation? Patrick, I'll emphasize what Patty said, but building that framework with maybe a bit more of a fail fast emphasis, because we really want to see these two things and they are going to move together as we sort of develop and refine uh, MRV, those testing and scalability and feasibility studies about the actual drawdown processes are also moving forward. So if you can fail quickly and sort of figure out which ones aren't going to work and which ones are, that'd be ideal. I absolutely agree. I mean, I, I think I gave a talk for a while that was always entitled, uh, always wrong and why that's a good thing. Because as scientists, right, there's, that's the only time you know something for certain when it's wrong. You know that that's not the, the case. <laughs> the other stuff, right? So it, it's it's good to be able to do that. I think uh, the idea of a framework is great. And I think if I could add anything just from a personal perspective here, and this is only a personal perspective, but I want everybody that I talk to to help convince me that recreating the Azola event is a bad thing um, because I, I'm really interested in that just from a from a personal curiosity perspective. Simon knows he hears me talk about this a lot, um, but that'll be the, uh, yeah, that'll be about it for me. Matt? Yeah, I mean, I hope we leave this week having figured out the critical aspects the scientific community needs to focus on in the next few years to enable uh, this industry to happen. Because I think, let's not forget we're all here because we need to remove CO2 from the atmosphere. Um, um, so it's sort of an urgent problem. I think we all agree on that. Yeah, it's going to happen. Like it's already happening, right? This market is coming for us, whether we like it or not. So we might as well. Simon. So understanding I'm talking to a room mostly for scientists, I'm wondering if we should um, put, walk away from this workshop having put bounds on the problem. You know, so you know, there are a lot of uncertainties. We need to develop uh, regulatory protocols. We need to understand the, the physics better, the, the biology better, et cetera. Why not apply these questions to a specific CDR event? So, so just for the, the sake of convenience, the, the, um, the alchemy enhancement experiment in the Turing Sea. Right. Mm -hmm. So that could be one of several, right? But in that particular scenario, you have um, a vignette, right? You have a certain type of instrumentation uh, that you may need to deploy for a certain period of time. You have some logistical constraints regarding moving the alkalinity out to, to that area, um, what these biological impacts might be, what the models might have to show. Those, those questions are bounded in that region. And um, you know, this, this thought comes from... Uh, you know, for a long time, we've had regional ocean modeling groups, right? Where they want to, people want to know more about one specific area, so they they compartmentalize it, and it makes things easier. Models aren't so so expensive to run, and so on. Um, so the knowledge you gain is kind of just applicable to that one area, but the um, understanding and the application of, of CDR and MRV is taken that much further because we've found this problem. So I wonder if we can think about you know almost applications of case studies, right, where we can take these questions and try to answer them just within the context of that one area, and potentially that would be a place where you develop an industry, right? Um, yeah. Breakout three session leaders, are you listening? <laughs> Maybe something for us to consider there. Um, questions from the room. We're going to start um, with one from online, and then I'll go every other. Uh, so uh, this question is from Adrian Sutton, and it's for Patty. Uh, Patty mentioned that the carbon market is moving towards data integration at large scales uh, using ML methods and uh, satellite data. What kind of spatial and temporal resolution, Simon, bounds in the problem, um, does the carbon market need in order to use this approach? Uh, and what part of MRV do they want to use it for? So you can find that in the chat if you want to uh, look at directly at that question yourself. Yeah, I was I was saying um, for those maps that I was showing, a lot of that's really helpful for policymakers and stakeholders just to kind of survey the land and identify uh, places um, and time periods where we would get the biggest bang for the buck. Um, a lot of these projects, you know, are on a knife's edge right now. The price of carbon should be higher than what it is. Um, and so um, figuring out where these projects are viable is an important service we could provide um, using things like Amerifux data and these machine learning approaches. 
Um, so that's really helpful for just understanding where the project should happen and the scale of these solutions. Um, but then also, you know, bringing all the data together into process-based models, those are some of the best ways of verifying um, these, the, the carbon sequestration or whatever it is you're working with. So um, what you might do is have a have a project that is in California and maybe you don't have an eddy covariance tower or ha don't have boots on the ground, but you can run this really great process-based model and uh, which is very well constrained and has known amounts of uncertainty with it. And that you can use to monitor your project or, or verify a project. So that's kind of how we were picturing it. Questions from the room? We have online participants, so we need you to use a mic. Does anyone know how much an eddy covariance tower is? What does it cost, Patty? Yeah, um, that's a really great question. We have, um, in that opinion article, we have a really great figure showing kind of like the cost and the profit margins of all of this. And so like if you're a project and you want to buy an eddy covariance tower, um, if you want methane on the tower, it's around 80 grand for terrestrial systems. Um, you know, that's going to be very expensive, not just to buy the tower, but also to, to man it, to process the data and collect the data, you know, correctly. Um, but, um, but once you scale up and we show in the, in the, in the article, when you do these kind of flux maps, um, and you use process-based models or you use remote sensing and machine learning, it actually becomes profitable. So, and we aren't there yet, right? So you're, um, these projects that are buying eddy covariance towers and using those to quantify their budgets, which those types of projects are happening in California. They're very expensive, but they are happening. That's sort of like, you know, the beginning of this, the evolution of this. And so we're hoping that as these maps and uh, pro data products are available, it becomes a lot more cost effective. Uh, Jamie. Yeah. This question is for Nora and Matt and also to Stephanie, which is right now, it sounds like the MRV that you're doing is largely voluntary and you're trying to be like the best that there is. But what, like my fear, and I don't know if it's shared, is that like for Charm, what if someone named Chuff comes along and does it with less MRV, less well, and we don't know if it worked, but they charge $5 less a ton. And then I think this trickles all the way up to Stephanie's big network map. Why isn't always a race to the bottom? where the node on that map that gives the cheapest, worst MRV is the one that becomes, like how do we keep that from being a negative spiral, death spiral? That's the question I have been dying to ask this panel, so thanks. Um, I'm happy to start. I mean, that Jamie, it's a really good question and it's a really big issue. And I think that that's where um, it's really important that there is a role for the compliance markets in this. And also just in general, I think right now, what's keeping that from happening is the fact that the buyers that are the primary buyers in this space are extremely rigorous about MRV. And then there are also a lot of nonprofit policy partners who are also you know, creating frameworks and trying to hold everybody accountable here. And then that is also tran transitioning into like members of Congress care about this too in their offices. And I think that's sort of like the check and balance that we're depending on right now. But I think it's really critical that they're, you know, currently the, I mean, there's a lot of issues and Stephanie could probably speak to this more about the like, you know, voluntary certification markets as they stand now for current carbon removals for, you know, forestation and things like that. And so I think that one of the concerns that we have um, in the, you know, permanent engineered removal space is like, how do you, you know, you don't want to be working with a partner that you're not certain is going to do that process thoroughly. And so there has to be an ongoing, you know, pressure for there to be um, standards and for that to have more of a, uh, you know, for the government to play a role there and for other buyers to continue to, to hold those standards. But I think that that's actually already an issue in the market where, you know, for Charm right, right now, we sell at $600 a ton. That's really expensive, right? We That cost curve is going to come down a lot but there has to be differentiation in the market around permanence and additionality and leakage and all those things to ensure that there is a you know that the, the different 
ways of removing carbon are valued accordingly. And a lot of people still say, you know what, it's a lot cheaper to do forest carbon, even if I can't actually verify it. Anybody else? I could to just add, if I could just add a little bit on um, what Nora was saying. I, I also think this is a, the critical question that we have here. And I, I'm, I'm sure this is not a, a controversial statement to make, but just because it's compliance doesn't make it better, right? So I think we need to keep that in mind. Even the compliance standards need to have a guidelines um, that puts them also on a better footing. So it's not just the voluntary, it's the compliance also. It's all of the standards need to have a higher kind of framework that they all follow so that they are on the same page for everything. And how this might happen really depends, right? We could imagine a bottom up approach where all of the different players come together and start developing something so that it creates a fair competition. And this is kind of a model that we see in a lot of different industries where all of the industry partners, you know, they, they might come under the umbrella of the international standard organization and they all work together to create one product that they could all meet and that reduces the unfairness of the competition because at the end of the day if we have a differentiated market where something that is non-permanent sells for cheaper than something that's permanent obviously the non-permanent cheaper thing is going to be bought but it's not equal to what the permanent approach is actually providing so we're creating this unfair competition so that's a bottom up approach and the problem here is that we're not really seeing that happening at least when we're looking across uh, the ecosystem of standards, um, there is no real coherence that is emerging. The only coherence I will say that we do see is that the methods that are used are the same. So they all want to do additionality. They all want to do counterfactuals. They all want to use LCA. And just because that has been the model for emission reduction and avoidance doesn't mean it should be the model for uh, carbon removal, right? If you, I just th think about this um, image of, of the first car, the first car ever invented looked like a horse-drawn carriage, right? So we didn't move away from, from the previous technology, but now cars really look very different to a horse, right? So we've finally taken advantage of what the new technology is offering. And I think we're in a sim similar situation here with carbon removal. We can take advantage of what carbon removal offers, which is that fundamental difference that we can physically measure what is happening. And then the second part is that we can have a, a top-down approach where somebody comes in and who that somebody is, is really up in the air, but somebody comes in and creates a framework um, that sort of puts all of these uh, standards um, on the same footing by creating guidelines that use a common denominator. So what is the least number of rules that we can have to still create the same output? And I, I think at, for us, it, it really seems like the, the main two outputs are uh, verifiability, so measurements, and durability, so permanence. All right. Oh. Can I just like... 30 sure. seconds to answer that question. And then I know it's break time. Um, so the measurement verification strategy I showed, which was, you know, measure, monitor, and model, that is our, that is in our contract with our first uh, customer stripe. To your, to your point, we happen to have a first customer who is very thoughtful about this and they work with carbon plan to, if you haven't read on the pre read list, um, very thoughtful uh, MRV methodology going forward. But human nature being what it is, there will be a race to the bottom. How do we prevent it? And I think that's why I put transparency up there. So if every carbon removal that this industry ever performs, if all the data and all the calculations are completely transparent, we can even go back in time and, and see what, what happened um, to, to at least know uh, some of the low quality ones and, and what they were. I think it's it's good to remember too that you know when we say things like reduce, reuse, recycle, we want to do them in most that order. And abatement needs to come first for a lot of the companies before they start looking for offsets. And sometimes that gets lost in the equation. And there's a little bit of sort of a 
so a reverse verification that should be happening at some point too but this is not a conversation really for us in this room or folks in the room session five <laughs> <laughs> but i do think there's something to be said for commoditization of some of the you know the the, the the products of these types of approaches, um, not just the carbon itself, but like we talk a lot about biomass, not just going to bioenergy, but also to durable goods. You know, there's a whole program that's just been um, uh, uh, announced within our PDSTIA program, right? Where we're talking about how can we make new building materials that are themselves low carbon in intensity, but also lead to uh, cleaner and lower carbon intensity buildings throughout their service life. And so a lot of what we're talking about here is, tends to be really transactional on, on the spot. So credits and offsets changing hands, but we maybe need to be thinking about that whole process across the whole timeline of the project or the protocol that be, they're being issued on. This makes a lot of sense in the agricultural world where we have crop rotations. We have to think about things like if I put fall nitrogen down, do I credit that for this year or for the next crop, right? And those things start to go away when we start looking at these transactions over longer time periods and thinking about them being more of a, a, a futures deal rather than an immediate transaction. All right. Uh, well, thanks so much uh, to all of our panelists in the room and online. Uh, as well as our keynote speakers. Go forth and get coffee. It's down the hill in Mosby. Yeah. I think Jamie can maybe tell people where to go yeah, because so I don't know. Where Back at eleven fifteen, please. Um, so I can't just like mushroom the We're going to get started. We have first. So for each, for most of our sessions, we have provided the opportunity for breakout for, or for lightning talks. And so we are going to have our first session one round of lightning talks. So we have our two speakers right up here in the front. Um, going to queue up your slides for you. So this is Lin Kwan Mu. Hi, everyone. My name is Lin Kwan Mu. And I'm a postdoc here at URI working with uh, Jamie Potter and uh, Hongjie Wang. So one of my primary research uh, goals here at URI is to use the sail drone data to analyze the PCO2 variability in the Gulf Stream region. And while the sail drones were underway, we did a thought experiment on how the ocean alkalinity enhancement 
would increase the carbon uptake uh, in the Amazon River plume. So why might someone consider adding alkalinity here? And that's because the Amazon River is the largest river in the world by discharge. And uh, a massive area in the ocean surface is uh, affected by it. And also because the river plume water will stay at the ocean surface for a very long time because of the strong stratification. And uh, that's allowing more time for the water to absorb additional CO2 from the atmosphere. So in our thought experiment, we considered what would be the minimum detectability for total alkalinity at the mouth. Um, so you can see here, um, we add the alkalinity at the river mouth and uh, we uh, consider the minimum detectability, which should be depending on how many samples we need to take at the river mouth. And even more so on um, how much alkalinity we add relative to the background variability, which has been measured um, to be about uh, 10 to 20 micromolar. So with, that, with those uh, two pieces of information in mind, um, we can conclude that for an alkalinity perturbation of 20 micromolar, it's readily detectable um, with uh, 20 samples um, in a given field survey in a given month. So what, uh, where would it get us um, with this level of perturbation? Um, and actually, uh, as you can see, um, the CO2 change in the plume relative to the perturbation um, baseline um, because of adding 20 micromolar of uh, alkalinity, we can uh, pretty much reduce up to um, 20 um, microatmosphere of a CO2 at the ocean surface, which is a perturbation level that's measurable with uh, sensors uh, that already exist and can be carried on surface vehicles um, or autonomous vehicles such as shells. Cell drone. And um, overall, uh, by adding 20 micromolar of alkalinity at the river mouth, we can potentially remove about 0.1 megatons of additional CO2 per month. And that's about 30 times greater than uh, performed by the orca plant in a year. And in order to achieve this, we'll need about 0.4 megatons of pulverized limestone per month. And that's roughly about 2% uh, of the annual limestone production in the US. So we do not know if this uh, alkalinity perturbation would cause uh, ecosystem disturbance, but by choosing um, a perturbation level that's barely detectable above the natural variability would reduce the likelihood for um, the ecosystem disturbance to occur. Um, we believe that uh, this kind of uh, thought experiment will be helpful first steps for considering um, you know, the realistic uh, MRV goals in future CDR endeavors. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Sarah Remsen, CEO of a company called Fathom Carbon. Um, my co-founder Adrian, Dr. Adrian Horfrost is not here. She's a professor of marine carbon cycling and an expert in machine learning. And she and I are exploring ways to scale MRV for and carbon crediting for coastal ecosystems. We did a very large assessment of most of the blue carbon projects that we could find um, over about 60. 57% uh, of those are mangrove, 21% are seagrass, 11% are salt marsh. But what we really realized is that the groups that are doing these projects, such as the Nature Conservancy and West Africa Blue, tend to be stuck in the bottleneck of MRV. Now, this shouldn't be a surprise. We're all here talking about MRV. We know how important it is. Um, but it was pretty interesting for us to realize that this was actually one of the huge barriers in bringing a lot of these projects to market. Um, so we've been exploring ways of using remote sensing to better understand the carbon variability in these coastal ecosystems, ultimately hopefully reducing the number of field samples and providing better feasibility assessments to assess which projects to actually invest in and get, in, get off the ground. And we're doing this by training a land cover model with satellite data, um, trying to understand, is this a mangrove? Is this a Caribbean pine? Things like that. We're combining that with below ground biogeochemical soil models, currently assessing which ones are the right ones for us to use. Um, and then we are looking at better stratified sampling so that we can estimate, or we're estimating variants so that we can establish better stratified sampling uh, with hopefully the same level of variability and confidence in the carbon that we can actually predict. 
Um, so we're looking for partners and collaborators and super excited to be here to talk more about MRV for other pathways. So thank you. So you should all have access to a document for the breakout groups with your assigned breakout room. Um, the topics are actually written into the agenda, the questions that will guide the breakout session. Again, the hazard rooms are over here. The large conference room is on the back hallway over there. And then there are two groups that are actually in here in the front and in the back. So please use the questions that are in the agenda for your prompts and go to the appropriate breakout room listed in the list. And there, those signs are posted around here and they're also, um, they're online. They're linked from in your workshop documents. You have one hour. I'm <laughs> 